Chapter 6, The Fight in the Courtyard. There was a courtyard behind the palace where the peacocks walked. Fountains played and statues of former kings and queens kept watch. As long as they didn't pull the peacocks' tails, jump in the fountains, or climb the statues, the children of the palace servants were allowed to play in the courtyard after school. Sometimes Lady Eslanda, who liked children, would come and make daisy chains with them. But the most exciting thing of all was when King Fred came out onto the balcony and waved, which made all the children cheer, bow, and curtsy as their parents had taught them. The only time the children fell silent, ceased their games of hopscotch, and stopped pretending to fight the Ichabog, it was when the lords Spittleworth and Flapoon passed through the courtyard. These two lords were not fond of children at all. They thought the little brats made far too much noise in the late afternoon, which was precisely the time when Spittleworth and Flapoon liked to take a nap between hunting and dinner. One day, shortly after Bert's and Daisy's seventh birthdays, when everyone was playing as usual between the fountains and the peacocks, the daughter of the new head seamstress, who was wearing a beautiful dress of rose pink brocade, said, Oh, I do hope the king waves at us today. Well, I don't, said Daisy, who couldn't help herself and didn't realize how loudly she had spoken. The children all gasped and turned to look at her. Daisy felt hot and cold at once, seeing them all glaring. You shouldn't have said that, whispered Bert, as he was standing right next to Daisy. The other children were staring at him, too. I don't care, said Daisy, color rising in her face. She'd started now, so she might as well finish. If he hadn't worked my mother so hard, she'd still be alive. Daisy felt as though... She'd been wanting to say that out loud for a very long time. There was another gasp from all the surrounding children, and the maid's daughter actually squealed in terror. He's the best king of cornucopia we've ever had, said Bert, who'd heard his mother say so many times. No, he isn't, said Daisy loudly. He's selfish, vain, and cruel. Daisy, whispered Bert horrified, don't be, don't be silly. It was the word silly that did it. Silly when the new head seamstress's daughter smirked and whispered behind her hand to her friends while pointing at Daisy's coveralls. Silly when her father wiped away his tears in the evening, thinking Daisy wasn't looking. Silly when to talk to her mother she had to visit a cold white headstone. Daisy drew her hand back and smacked Bert right across the face. Then the oldest Roach brother, whose name was Roderick, and who now lived in Daisy's old bedroom, shouted, Don't let her get away with it, Butterball! And led all the boys in shouts of, Fight! 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 Terrified, Bert gave Daisy's shoulder a half-hearted shove, and it seemed to Daisy that the only thing to do was launch herself at Bert, and everything became dust and elbows until suddenly the two children were, were pulled apart by Bert's father, Major Beamish, who'd come running out of the palace on hearing the commotion to find out what was going on. Dreadful behavior, muttered Lord Spittleworth, walking past the Major and the two sobbing, struggling children. But as he turned away, a broad smirk spread over Lord Spittleworth's face, he was a man who knew how to turn a situation to good use, and he thought he might have found a way to banish children, or some of them anyway, from the palace courtyard. Chapter 7. Lord Spittleworth Tells Tales That night, the two lords dined, as usual, with King Fred. After a sumptuous meal of Baronstown venison, accompanied by the finest Jeroboam wine, followed by a selection of Kurdsburg cheeses and some of Mrs. Beamish's feather-light fairies' cradles, Lord Spittleworth decided the moment had come. He cleared his throat, then said, I do hope, Your Majesty, 
that you weren't disturbed by that dis disgusting fight among the children in the courtyard this afternoon. Fight? repeated King Fred, who'd been talking to his tailor about the design for a new cloak, so had heard nothing. What fight? Oh, dear. I, I thought your majesty knew, said Lord Spittleworth, pretending to be startled. Perhaps Major Beamish could tell you all about it. But King Fred was amused rather than disturbed. Oh, I believe scuffles among children are quite usual, Spittleworth. Spittleworth and Flapoon exchanged looks behind the king's back, and Spittleworth tried again. Your majesty is, as ever, the very soul of kindness, said Spittleworth. Of course, some kings, Flapoon muttered, brushing crumbs off the front of his waistcoat. If they had heard that a child spoke of the crown so disrespectfully, what's that, exclaimed Fred, the, smiling fa the smile fading from his face. A child spoke of me disrespectfully? Fred couldn't believe it. He was used to the children shrieking with excitement when he bowed to them from the balcony. I believe so, your majesty, said Spittleworth, examining his fingernails. But as I mentioned, it was Major Beamish who separated the children. He has all the details. The candles sputtered a little in their silver ticks. Children say all manners of things in fun, said King Fred. Doubtless, the child meant no harm. Sounded like bolly reason to me, grunted Flapoon. But, said Spittleworth swiftly, it is Major Beamish who knows the details. Flapoon and I may perhaps have misheard. Fred sipped his wine. At that moment, a footman entered the room to remove the pudding plates. Cankerby, said King Fred, for such was the footman's name. Fetch Major Beamish here. Unlike the king and the two lords, Major Beamish didn't eat seven-course dinners every night. He'd finished his supper hours ago and was getting ready for bed when the summons from the king arrived. The major hast hastily swapped his pajamas for his uniform and dashed back to the palace, by which time King Fred, Lord Spillworth, and Lord Flapoon had retired to the yellow parlor, and where they were sitting on satin armchairs, drinking more Jeroboam wine, and in Flapoon's case, eating a second plate of fairy's candles. Ah, Beamish, said King Fred, as the major made a deep bow. I hear there was a little commotion in the courtyard this afternoon. And the major's heart sank. He'd hoped that news of Bert and Daisy's fight would not reach the king's ears. Oh, it was really nothing, your majesty, said Beamish. Come, come, Beamish, said Flapoon. You should be proud that you've taught your son not to tolerate traitors. I... There was no mention of treachery, said Major Beamish. They're only children, my lord. Do I understand that your son defended me, Beamish, said King Fred. Major Beamish was in a most unfortunate position. He didn't want to tell the king what Daisy had said. Whatever his own loyalty to the king, he quite understood why the motherless little girl felt the way she did about Fred, and the last thing he wanted to do was to get her into trouble. At the same time, he was well aware that there were 20 witnesses who could tell the king exactly what Daisy had said, and was sure that if he lied, Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flapoon would tell the king that he, Major Beamish, was also disloyal and treacherous. I... Yes, your majesty, it's true that my son Bert defended you, said Major Beamish. However, allowance must be surely made for the little girl who said the the unfortunate thing about your majesty. She'd passed through a great deal of trouble, your majesty, and even unhappy grown-ups may talk wildly at times. What kind of trouble has the girl passed through, asked King Fred, who couldn't imagine any good reason for a subject to speak rudely of him. She, her name is Daisy Dovetail, your majesty, said Major Beamish, staring over King Fred's head at a picture of his father, King Richard the Righteous. Her mother was the seamstress who, yes, yes, I remember, said King Fred loudly, cutting Major Beamish off. Very well, that's all, Beamish. Off you go.
Somewhat relieved, Major Beamish bowed deeply again and almost reached the door when he heard the king's voice. What exactly did the girl say, Beamish? Major Beamish paused with his hand on the doorknob. There was nothing else for it but to tell the truth. She said that your majesty is selfish, vain, and cruel, said Major Beamish, not daring to look at the king. He left the room. Chapter 8, The Day of Petition. Selfish, vain, and cruel. Selfish, vain, and cruel. The words echoed in the king's head as he pulled on his silk nightcap. It couldn't be true, could it? It took Fred a long time to fall asleep. And when he awoke in the morning, he felt, if anything, worse. He decided he wanted to do something kind. And the first thing that occurred to him was to reward Beamish's son, who had defended him against that nasty little girl. So he took a small medallion that usually hung around the neck of his favorite hunting dog, asked a maid to thread ribbon through it, and summoned the Beamishes to the palace. Bert, whom his mother had pulled out of class and hurriedly dressed in a blue velvet suit, was struck speechless in the presence of the king, which Fred enjoyed, and he spent several minutes speaking kindly to the boy, while Major and Mrs. Beamish nearly bust, burst with pride in their son. Finally, Bert returned to school with his little gold medal around his neck and was made much of in the playground that afternoon by Roderick Roach, who was usually his biggest bully. Daisy said nothing at all, and when Bert caught her eye, he felt hot and uncomfortable and shoved the medal out of sight beneath his shirt. The king, meanwhile, still wasn't entirely happy. An uneasy feeling stayed with him like indigestion, and again, he found it hard to sleep that night. When he woke the next day, he remembered that it was the day of petition. The day of petition was a special day held once a year when the subjects of Cornucopia were permitted an audience with the king. Naturally, these people were carefully screened by Fred's advisors before they were allowed to see him. Fred never dealt with big problems. He saw people whose troubles could be solved with a few gold coins and a few kind words. A farmer with a broken plow, for instance, or an old lady whose cat had died. Fred had been looking forward to the day of petition. It was a chance to dress up in his fanciest clothes, and he found it so touching to see how much he meant to the ordinary people of Cornucopia. Fred's dressers were waiting for him after breakfast with a new outfit he'd requested just the previous month. White satin pantaloons and matching doublet with gold and pearl buttons, a cloak edged with ermine, ermine, ermine and lined in scarlet, and white satin shoes with gold and pearl buckles. His valet was wait his valet was waiting with the golden tongs ready to curl his mustache, and a page boy stood ready with a number of jeweled rings on a velvet cushion, waiting for Fred to make his selection. Take all that away, I don't want it, said King Fred crossly, waving at the outfit the dressers were holding up for his approval. The dressers froze. They weren't sure they'd heard correctly. King Fred had taken an immense interest in the progress of the costume and had requested the addition of the scarlet lining and fancy buckles himself. I said, take it away, he snapped when nobody moved. Fetch me something plain. Fetch me that suit I wore to my father's funeral. Is, is your majesty quite well? inquired his valet as the astonished dressers bowed and hurried away with the white suit and returned in double quick time with the black one. Of course I'm well, snapped Fred, but I'm a man, not a frivoling poppin' jay. He shrugged on the black suit, which was the plainest he owned, though still rather splendid, having silver edging to the cuffs and collar and onyx and diamond buttons. Then, to the astonishment of the valet, he permitted the man to curl only the very ends of his mustache before dismissing both him and the page boy bearing the cushion full of rings. There, thought Fred, examining himself in the mirror, how am I to be called, how am I called vain? 
black definitely is not one of my best colors. So unusually speedy had Fred been getting dressed that Lord Spittleworth, who was making one of Fred's servants dig earwax out of his ears, and Lord Flapoon, who was guzzling a plate of Duke's Delights, which he'd ordered from the kitchens, were caught by surprise and came running out of their bedrooms, pulling on their waistcoats and hopping as they put on their boots. Hurry up, you lazy chaps, called King Fred as the two lords chased him down the corridor. There are people waiting for my help. And would a selfish king hurry to meet simple people who wanted favors from him, thought Fred? No, he wouldn't. Fred's advisors were shocked to see him on time and plainly dressed for Fred. Indeed, Herringbone, the chief advisor, wore an approving smile as he bowed. Your Majesty is early, he said. The people will be delighted. They've been queuing since dawn. Show them in, Herringbone, said the king, settling himself on his throne and gesturing to Spittleworth and Flapoon to take the seats on either side of him. The doors were opened, and one by one the petitioners entered. Fred's subjects often became tongue-tied when they found themselves face to face with the real, live king, whose picture hung in their town halls. Some began to giggle or forgot what they'd come for, and once or twice people fainted. Fred was particularly gracious today, and each petition ended with the king handing out a couple of gold coins, or blessing a baby, or allowing an old woman to kiss his hand. Today, though, while he smiled and handed out gold coins and promises, the words of Daisy Dovetail kept echoing in his head, selfish, vain, and cruel. He wanted to do something special to prove what a wonderful man he was, to show that he was ready to sacrifice himself for others. Every king of Cornucopia had handed out gold coins and trifling favors on the day of petition. Fred wanted to do something so, so splendid that it would ring down the ages and you didn't get into the history books by replacing a fruit farmer's favorite hat. The two lords on either side of Fred were becoming bored. They'd spent... They'd much rather had been left to loll in their bedrooms until lunchtime than sit here listening to peasants talking about their petty troubles. After several hours, the last petitioner passed gratefully out of the throne room, and Flapoon, whose stomach had been rumbling for nearly an hour, heaved himself out of his chair with a sigh of relief. Lunchtime, boomed Flapoon, but just as the guards were attempting to close the doors, a kerfluffle was heard, and the doors flew open once more. The end for today.